wonderful to see you here today. I'd like to begin our journey through his word with Psalm 73. No doubt about it. God is good. Good to good people. Good to the good hearted. But I nearly missed it. Missed seeing his goodness. I was looking the other way. Looking up to the people at the top. Envying the wicked who have it made. Who have nothing to worry about. Not a care in the whole wide world. When I was beleaguered and bitter. Totally consumed by envy. I was totally ignorant, a dumb, a dumb ox in your very presence. I'm still in your presence, but you've taken my hand. You wisely and tenderly lead me, and then you bless me. You're all I want in heaven. You're all I want on earth. When my skin sags, my bones get brittle, God is rock firm and faithful. Look, those who left you are falling apart. Deserters, they'll never be heard from again. But I'm in the very presence of God. Oh, oh, how refreshing it is. I've made Lord God my own. God, I'm telling the world what you do. That is why we're here today to celebrate God and tell the world and to remind ourselves what God has done. And I want you to celebrate with me that God allows, him, allows us to call him our home, to come and to dwell with him. 17 years ago this month, I received a phone call. John, my oldest sister's husband, died instantly in a car accident. He was 29 years old. Some of you have had phone calls like that. Six months earlier, his son had been born. And so in an instant, in a moment, on a rainy San Antonio day, my sister became a single mom with an infant. And at that moment, she faced a decision. She faced a critical decision, and you have faced these, these decisions, or you will face these decisions. And for my sister, the decision was this. After my husband has died who's not even 30 and left me with a six-month-old, almost six-month-old son. What am I going to do? Am I going to trust God that he cares for me and loves me and will provide? Am I going to trust God? Or am I going to surrender to the excruciating pain and emotional pain of such a great loss? Am I going to trust God? Or am I going to surrender to pain, physical and emotional? And I tell you that you will or have faced that. And you know as well as I, if you faced it, that this is a pivotal moment in your life. And I don't say that lightly. It will change the path of your life, the decision you, the decision you make at that moment. Will I trust God or will I dwell in what happened? Will I go and face God and say, God, I don't understand, but I still trust you? Or will I dwell in the pain and the agony, which I wish I could get rid of, but I can't because I haven't trusted. And this will, you know, if you've experienced this, and I know all of us will to some degree, you know what it is like if you choose to dwell, if you choose to hang out where it hurts. It changes your life. Now, thankfully, my sister chose to trust God, to trust that God would bless and God would care. And it did. He did. Later, she married a wonderful man. It's actually the first wedding ceremony I ever performed. And they're happily married now and raising two children, the son I mentioned, as well as a daughter. And he takes care of her and she takes care of him and they love one another and take care of their kids. And now that baby is a 17 year old kid getting ready to finish his senior year in high school you, you know that feeling some of you are anticipating that feeling you can't wait perhaps all of us know that feeling of that life transition leaving that senior year and getting ready for college or leaving that senior year and getting ready to go to your job or whatever it looks like for you you know what that looks like and as part of that 
process, my nephew has to share his story. If you've been there, you understand this. College, you want to know not just your GPA, but what you've done and, and kind of your story. And so along with his university application packet, he includes his story. And I think it's wonderful that in this year of deny self, J Jesus said to us, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And so all of us ask ourselves, what is my deny self? Deny self story. And for my nephew, he's written his deny self story. And with his permission, I share these words from a young man of 17 who's obviously experienced a moment where he has to make a choice. Most of everything I know comes from my family. My family has always been there for me through good times and bad. However, I've always felt that something in my life was missing. I've grown up with one fact always in the back of my mind. I never knew my real father. He passed away in a car accident when I was less than six months old. He died instantly upon impact. There was no fault in the accident. It was just a slippery road due to rain and a semi coming in the opposite lane. My mother was then going to law school and raising me in San Antonio, Texas. After his death, my mother and I moved in with her parents. She never finished law school. Fortunately, she married a new man who became the dad I know today. I never felt the absence of a father, but having this person that my entire family knew and loved that I never had the chance to meet makes me realize that life can't always be fair. Some things in life simply happen, and life is full of coincidences, good and bad. I don't harbor any anger over the death of my father. It wasn't something he did that caused it. It was just bad luck. Even though I've heard so many stories of his life, sometimes it still doesn't feel right that I never had the chance to truly meet him. As much as I would love to just talk to him and get to know him personally, I still get to experience his legacy in little ways. He was a college mascot who wore his school's costume in every football game. And he and I both went to Baylor, by the way, and so I saw the mascot yesterday and Baylor lost, unfortunately. <laughs> I still own a couple of his official jerseys that he wore over his costume. My grandmother gave me a lot of old things after he died. A vintage electric guitar, all of his old patches from scouting, and my personal favorite, all of his cassette tapes. Anybody remember cassette tapes? <laughs> Some of these tapes are even recordings of his high school garage band covering Rolling Stone songs. I even have the original home answer machine tape of the day of his death. Along with hundreds of other little mementos of his life, I'm able to see whom this man that I hear all about really was. He was kind, intelligent, and according to all my mom's friends, had the best sense of humor. He was always determined and always had an open mind when it came to the unknown. I have two options. I'm confronted with the fact that this man is gone from my life before I've ever, I've, I even had the chance to meet him. I can either dwell on the fact that he is not here anymore, or I can spend my life becoming the person that he, as my father, would want me to become. I know that he would want me to explore life outside my community and see what the rest of the world has to offer. He was an adventurous man who, according to my grandmother, couldn't wait until he left college and moved away. It's futile to live in the past and continue to remind yourself of things that are out of your control. Life is filled with events and moments that you really wish didn't happen, but there is always more ahead. Wise words from a young man who's experienced heartache in life. There is life that surrounds us, and sometimes that life is a great encouragement and a great gift and a great joy. And sometimes life really hurts really hurts. Jeff Mannion is a man, a pastor who's written a book, and thinking of those times in life, he uses the phrase, the land in between. And I want you to think as we go through this message, what is your land in between? What is your land in between? And what's he talking about? Well, some of you know this from the small groups you're in right now, and if not, let me fill you in. There's a people called the Hebrew people, the people of Israel. 
that God has promised to redeem and promised to give life and purpose to. But the problem is they find themselves in slavery generation after generation and generation. And God, the Bible says, remembers his covenant to them, their father Abraham. And he comes and rescues them by a man named Moses, de defeats um, Egypt for the power of God and not for the power of man. And they're going to Canaan. They're looking forward to the land of promise, the land of milk and honey. But guess what? There's a land in between. There's a land in between Egypt and there's a land that is there that is between Egypt and between Canaan. And this is where we find them stuck in the land in between. I want you to think about, again, what is your land in between? Jeff Manning writes it this way. I know most of us can relate. If not to the specific one, your own. A necessary middle space. A barren wilderness separates Egypt and Canaan. And here the Israelites will spend considerable time before moving to their new home. The desert is where they receive the Ten Commandments, the core of their covenant with God. It is also where a portable worship tent, the tabernacle, will be built. The desert is not intended to be their final destination, but rather a necessary middle space. Where they will be formed as a people and established in their connection to God. But the desert, of course, is a hard place. Though Egypt was a land of slavery, suffering, and agony, it was also brimming with lush vegetation. The rich waters of the Nile caused Egypt to flourish agriculturally. Canaan, too, the people's future home, was noble for its prosperity. It was, as God described it, the land flowing with milk and honey. But as the Israelites moved from the lush, fertile home of their past, to the lush, fertile home of their future, they pass through the wilderness. They are stuck in the middle, the desert, the undesired space between more desirable spaces. This middle space, the land in between, will serve as a metaphor for the undesired transitions we, too, experience in life. For the Israelites, their experience in the wasteland was not meant to be a waste. What's your wasteland? For many of us, the journey into the land between comes suddenly with a conversation that drops into our lives like an exploding bomb. Your position has been eliminated. I don't love you anymore. The tumor is malignant. The church elders are meeting to take a vote of confidence. Mom, Dad, I'm pregnant. I'm having second thoughts about this wedding. Dad, uh, I'm at the police station. Your mother and I are getting a divorce. We're moving. We think mom's had a stroke. How soon can you get to the hospital? In a sentence, we are ripped from normality and find ourselves in a new world as if thrown from a moving train. What is your land in between? What is that sentence? What is that phrase that really just sits on your stomach and makes it churn? What is that moment or what are those moments in your life where you did not see it coming and you have a decision? Am I going to trust God and that he cares and that he loves me and will provide for me? And or I'm gonna, am I going to dwell in the circumstances and going to dwell in the yuck and the depression and the hurt and the anger and the regret? Jesus, always be honest, never lying. The one who says, I'm going to tell you what life's going to be like, said this. I tell you the truth. Here on earth, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. That's not good news, folks. But it's true news. And that's what, one of the things I love about God is he doesn't come to me and say, Mark, if you'll follow me, everything will be rosy. Mark, if you come to me, you'll never experience pain. Jesus knows better than that. He's not a liar. And I'm not, I'm not going to buy that anyway. I know you're not. So Jesus comes to us and says, look at the underlying words. In this world, you what? You will have trouble. It doesn't say you might have trouble. It doesn't say that you could have trouble. It doesn't say you may be headed for trouble. It says you will have trouble. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe I can swallow that. But then the second punch comes. 
that left hook have many trials and sorrows. Okay, I can handle one or two, can't you? But many? Come on, God, are you serious? In this life, I'm going to have many trials and sorrows, not just one, not just two, but many. Many. And so then we drive ourselves crazy trying to figure out just one thing. And we try to figure out that one thing with one question. It's gut response. It's the first thing I go to and you go to if you experience pain. And that question is why? Why did this have to happen? Why did that happen? Why did they make that choice? Why did I make that choice? Why, God, did this happen? Well, that question is broken. It's a very flawed question. And I want to point out to you and remind myself of two major flaws when it comes to that question, why? When you've met, entered into that land in between, when you've had the decision of am I going to trust God or am I going to dwell in the pain, and the decision comes down to, am I going to ask the question, why? And perhaps you're going to ask it, and most likely you're going to ask it, but listen before you do. There are two major flaws in that question. The first major, major flaw in the question, why, is it is most often unanswerable. You're going to ask why to a lot of hard questions in life, and most often it's going to be unanswerable. Yes, you can find some clues, and, and yes, you can find some things that that might be evidence on the side, but truly at the gut, why is not answerable most of the time. But the second flaw of the question is even more painful to hear, but we need to hear it, just as Jesus knows we need to hear the truth. And the second flaw in the question why is that even when it is answered, it rarely solves the issue. It rarely calms the heart. It rarely heals the pain. And so if I look at the question why and say, well, it's probably not answerable, and if it is, and it's not going to calm or heal, it's not going to do any of the stuff I wish it would do. You ever had that experience? You finally do, do get an answer and say, well, that didn't help. <laughs> now I know why that didn't help. Why well, did I even ask the question in the first place? And so I want to submit to you a better question to ask. Not why. Not why. But what now? Now that this thing happened in my life, now that this pain has entered my life, now that I've lost my father, now that I've lost my child, now that my marriage has fallen apart, now that I've lost my job, now that I've invested in so much and it's all tanked, now that my health is falling apart, now that my dream is dead, what am I going to do? Sit back and ask why? Well, again, that's not very wise. So let's ask the question, what now? Cullen, my nephew, again, hear these words. It's futile to live in the past and continue to remind yourself of things that are out of your control. Life is filled with events and moments that you really wish didn't happen, but there's always more ahead. There is more ahead. There's more hope. There's more grace. There's more life. There's more living. It is all ahead. And so I want to challenge you to look ahead, to look ahead, to know that there is more ahead, but it may sound contradictory to what I said, and it may confuse you a bit, but hang with me. Before you look ahead, I want you to look back. And specifically, I want you to look back at this table. You see, by looking back at what this table represents, we understand why we can look forward. Because I praise God that John chapter 16, the verse you read earlier, does not end with, in this world, you will have many trials and sorrows. He says, but take heart. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. You see that? But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Do you get that? Do you believe that? Do you understand that? Yes. And Jesus says, yes, life is hard. That began in Genesis chapter 3, when sin entered this world. And now we make 
foolish decisions, and people around us make foolish decisions, and the earth is falling apart as we know it. And relationships fall apart. I was talking to a man this morning, and I grieved for him because literally I felt like he was a 13-year-old learning how to cuss for the first time. Every other word was a cuss word, and I thought, poor man, this guy doesn't have a vocabulary. It's a heart of pain. It's just ripping out of him. He doesn't understand how broken he is because he's just griping at everybody else in the world. And don't worry, it wasn't in this building. <laughs> but we're in here too. You see, God says if you're going to look forward, you need to look back. In this world, you will have many trials and sorrows. But check this out. I added that. Check this out. Fear not. I have overcome the world. I have overcome it. I have overcome, I have overcome your pain. I have overcome your disappointment. I have overcome your land in between. I have overcome everything because I have died on this cross for you. And no matter how big your problem is, I love you. And no matter how devastated you may feel, you still have me. That's what Jesus is saying. And some of you are hurting so badly this morning. And I want you to be able to, on next Thursday to say thank you, God, even if your life is a mess because Jesus still loves you. And that is why we're doing this this morning, to remember, remember why we need to be thankful in the first place. Fear not. Fear not. I want to read a passage of scripture to you in just a moment. It's a beautiful passage of scripture. And I need to tell you who wrote it, first of all. Because it makes a difference when you know where these words are coming from. Some of them call them saints, but... He didn't qualify, none of us do. His name's Paul. He used to be Saul until God got into his life. Saul was educated, he was smart, he was brilliant, he had the right family tree, he had the right connections, he had everything going his way. He had access to the religious elite, he had access to the government that ruled the nation at the time. He had it all going for him. Psalm 73 says, he got, he's got no worry in the world until Jesus comes to visit. And he realized just how lost and how confused he was. And Jesus comes to him and literally blinds this man. He says, I got something to show you. You can't see with your eyes now, but look, you listen to me with your heart. And once he commits his life to Christ, his eyes open up literally and figuratively. And he says, I am walking for Christ. This world can't do anything to me because I'm walking with Christ. To the point that he looks death in the face. He knows he's going to die for the Lord. He trusts that. And he says, I'm going to look death in the face. And he literally, I think, spits in the face of God. And he says, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Now, again, don't think this guy is some saint that you can't ever achieve his status because none of us can. And he didn't either. And what else did he say? Not only did he say, O oh death, where is your sting? He also said, man, what a wretched man am I. Everything I want to do and know I should do, I don't do. And everything I don't want to do and know I shouldn't do, I do. What a wretched man am I. And then Paul looks at himself among all the sin of the world, all the yuck of the world, and he says, woe of me, worst of sinners. Was he really the worst of sinners? No, but he knew it. He knew he was a sinner. And that Paul, that man, that man that could face life and death itself said, I trust Jesus. And in case we didn't understand what he meant, under the inspiration of God, he writes these words that we'll now hear. And as you hear these words, as you listen to these words, I want you to ask yourself one question. Let's keep it simple. One question. I want you to answer this one question as you read through this passage. And here's that one question. Because it makes all the difference. It's that pivotal point, that land in between. Because if you don't believe this, you're going to get stuck here. But if you believe this, you're going to be able to trust God and know that he cares for you and he loves for you and he has great plans for you that he knew even before you were conceived. Listen to this. Gives me goosebumps getting ready to read. No kidding. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. We look at the sun and see the God who cannot be seen. 
We look at the sun and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning. And leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. You yourselves are a case study of what he does. At one time, you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got. But now, by giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives together, whole and holy in his presence. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in the bond of trust, constantly tuned in to the message, careful not to be distracted or diverted. There is no other message, just this one. Praise be to God for that passage, because what it's telling us is everything holds together with Jesus. There's nothing that Jesus doesn't know. There's nothing that Jesus doesn't handle. There's nothing that Jesus doesn't understand. Jesus is there, beginning to end, supreme over all things, and all things Stuff and people and animal, animals and atoms and everything get, gets put back together because Jesus Christ makes it happen. Paul says elsewhere that by the foolish things, by the foolish things, he has overcome the world, meaning that this couldn't be man's design. We just messed it up in the first place. And so I've come, Jesus says, that you may have life. And the way he did this is by putting himself on the cross. He says, no man puts me there. I walk willingly to the cross. It didn't matter how powerful Rome was, how righteous and haughty the church was, synagogue at the time. They couldn't put him on that cross. He willingly went to that cross to die for you and to die for me. And he says, if you'll trust in me, your life will be put back together. Yes, you'll still have pain. Yes, you'll still have heartache. Yes, you'll be stuck in your lands in between. But trust in me because when you come to me, you have hope, you have life, and your encouragement. If you think I'm getting excited about this news, I am because it's the best news on the planet. And that's why it's called the gospel, which means good news. That if in my sin, while I was still yet a sinner, Christ died on the cross for me, and he is faithful and just to forgive what? All of unrighteousness. Not just part of my sin, not just part of my shame, it's not part of your life that's all messed up, but every single thing that is in your life, God says, I can handle it. Everything. Every single thing. Now, if you don't believe that, let's change that this morning. Let's change that. And just let it go. There's something you've been carrying for a long time, just let it go. To God, I'm done with it. And God says, come on. My shoulders are big enough. Yours aren't. Put it on. Put it on. And so I've got to ask you this question. I asked you a few moments ago. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? If you believe that, and if you said, I understand what that means, then you'll really understand what this means. If you don't believe that, I think that you just yet don't believe. There'll come a day. And I pray that day is today. That finally your stubbornness, your arrogance, your pride, your stuck in your debt, whatever it is, that you just surrender to God. Because what this meal is about is this. Jesus says, I came into this world and I love you enough to give my body penalty of death to be wiped out because of the blood of the Lamb. I happen to be the atonement. He comes before them and he takes the bread. 
He's among his disciples, and he takes the bread, he lifts it before them, and he says, this is my body given for you. And if that isn't powerful enough, he does this after he says that. This is my body given for you. This is my body given for you. Do you get the image? I will be torn. I will be shredded. Because I love you. And then, if that wasn't powerful enough, he lifted up the fruit of the vine. They've been drinking a few cups of these. Passover meal. Just fruit of the vine up to that point. But then Jesus says, you see this cup? This is my blood. The blood of the covenant, the blood of the promise, which is poured out to many for the forgiveness of sins. He says, this is my body, and this is my blood. In other words, this is how much I love you. And this is what your sin is going to do to me. I love you. I love you. I love you. And so at this time in the service, we're going to have thrilling time. And that is, we're going to receive this meal. And if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you call this church home or some other church home, please take this meal. If you're not a believer in Christ, would you believe in him today? Would you say, wow, I get it. I understand it. I embrace it. I follow it. I follow him. Now's your time to do that. We're going to do this in a real special way this morning. Our deacons are going to be at one of these two tables. I'm going to be here. And our, our priest team is going to and as I do, I invite you to come to whichever table is nearest to you or whatever table you want to come to. And you'll be served the bread and the cup. And reflect upon what Jesus has done for you. Now you can take these elements and eat them right here by the table. You can take them back to you and pray over them. Take them, you can come to the altar and just bow before God and take them however you feel comfortable. This time is going to be dedicated completely to remembering that this is his body and this is his blood given for us. Let us pray. God, it is a privilege to be in this place today. And God, I thank you for the great promise of your word. Thank you that you love us so deeply and dearly. Thank you that there can't be too much in our lives to keep you from loving us. Thank you that you love us, you love us, you love us. And so as we go into this time of communion, as we share this meal together, help us to know that because of your love, this great love, that we can come to this place today and celebrate victory of death. Christ's name I pray.